And good afternoon to everyone. Sorry for the short delay there. We just wanted to make sure that we got as many people in as possible for the start. You're very welcome to Energy Days. And this is the session we have for March. And we have some very interesting speakers as part of today's program. First of all, I want to extend a big welcome on behalf of IRIS, the Energy Institute at the Eindhoven University of Technology to everybody. And thanks, of course, for being here. And we hope you'll enjoy the program you're going to see. My name is Barry Fitzgerald. I am your host and moderator for today's session. And for those who don't know who I am, I am a TUE IRIS science communication officer, and my work is involved in science communication. And occasionally I do things like this, host or moderate events, mostly online, of course, at the moment with the current situation we find ourselves in. And today we have two speakers in the program. I will be introducing those speakers before they speak later on, and we'll have hopefully very nice presentations and some nice discussion points with them after they have finished their contribution. But first of all, it would be quite nice if we got to know each other a little bit, given that we have a lot of people in attendance and it's just nice to, to meet and greet a small bit before we get into the business of the day. And what we're going to do is we're going to have Mentimeter questions throughout the session and we're going to start off with two very simple Mentimeter questions. What I suggest you do is the following. You can go to menti.com and you can put in the code 91825386. I repeat that again, just if you can't see it clearly, menti.com, code is 91825386. And everybody should see this on the screen. I'm seeing some likes coming through, which is a good indication that everything is in working order and uh, keep the likes coming. So we'll get through, we'll get on to the first question of the day in the get to know each other. Right, let's get on to the part, as I say, let's get to know each other. Here's question number one. From where are you watching this virtual en Energy Days event? Are you in the Netherlands? Are you in Europe, but outside the Netherlands? Or are you outside Europe even? And we see that there's a huge, a huge number of people in the Netherlands. Um, the majority of which are in the Netherlands. I probably should have put in another another option, which would have been in the Eindhoven region and outside the Eindhoven region. Okay, so we'll let the answers keep flowing. Interesting, interested to see if we've got anybody from outside of Europe. Uh, as, as I said, the majority here are based in the Netherlands and we have 95 responses there. I'll let them keep trickling through just for another moment or two, just to just to get a consensus on what's going. We do have one outside of Europe. Fantastic, excellent. If you could maybe put that into the chat and the team will forward on the information. Where are you watching from outside of Europe? I'm very interested to know. Okay, that's the first question. Let's take a look at the second question. And this is just about where you're coming from. So what term best describes your current role? Would it be industry, academia, government, startup organization, PhD researcher, student, or other? Quite a number of options there. So let's watch the bars change and dance as we get the responses from everyone. I'd say a lot of in individuals based in academia, a lot of PhD students, PhD researchers. Um, we have students as well, and we have other. I'd be interested what the others are so that I can refine this question for future events. So again, if you just let us know in the chat what you're in regards to the other other uh, other roles. Right, so we've had a 111 responses to that, 116. So the majority are in academia and there's 24 in others. So I definitely need to refine some of the options. We have a spread then across the other options. Well, there you go. That's some of the questions. We'll be back later on with more questions after each of the speakers has given their presentation. And I just want to, first of all, say at the start, thanks to Team Energy for helping out with not only with some of the questions, but also they're going to facilitate sending me the questions to ask the speakers during this event. And there will be, of course, more questions later, as I've indicated. Now it's time for the program. So let's get straight into it. And the theme for today we're going to be reflecting on the challenges that the energy transition will have to deal with, and that will come from two different perspectives, so two different point of views 
on this particular aspect in the energy transition. And our first speaker is uh, Floris Alcamada. And uh, Floris, I'm going to put a picture of Floris there so everyone can get an idea of what he looks like. So when he comes up on the screen, he is an architect and an urban designer. He is currently the chief government architect and has a teaching position at the Academy for Architecture in Amsterdam. Last year, he published his essay, The Future of the Netherlands, in which he outlines the enormous challenges of our time in the Netherlands. The current crisis makes the art of changing direction even more necessary. And in his lecture, Floris will discuss many issues and the energy transition in particular. Floris, the virtual floor is yours. Yeah, thank you for this introduction. And um, I'll start uh, sharing my screen. Hopefully that uh, will work in good order. And um, as said, I'll, uh, ask, I'll try to elaborate in this lecture on, on the way we could think of uh, the future of the Netherlands. And in my role as a chief government architect is something I, I do professionally. And um, the good thing in it is that uh, as in my position, you have a direct access to the government. So you can talk to ministers, you can address issues, they can ask you for advice, but you also can give advice. bring in a coherent way all the different issues we have to face today as a generation, as a country. To me, I think the key question, uh, summarizing all the other questions is, how can we arrange our lives that we no longer leave a trace of destruction? Because uh, no matter how you look at it, the way we live, the way we live our lives these days, they do create destruction. And that's something we have to counter. And uh, that is a beautiful, beautiful uh, mission for our generation. Can we change the way we live? Can we change the way we produce? Can we change the way we produce and consume energy? That will ask uh, the best of us. That will ask all our knowledge combined, uh, good collaborations. And um, But it's, um, it's a critical question. And uh, the way it's urgent, you can define in many different ways. Huh? This is a, a future perspective, once drawn for the Netherlands uh, in, in the coming centuries. Uh, the truth of this image is that it might be a very realistic scenario that we are facing. But of course, we cannot act with dystopia only. We need to find a way to define our responsibility, to define our agenda. And that is something which has to do with, in the current debate, believers and non-believers. You see protests, you see um, the conservative newspapers trying to deny it. Okay, but what are you talking about? It's not such a big deal. Interesting uh, the way um, uh, Greta Thunberg uh, positioned herself. She said, uh, don't listen to me. Listen to science, because they are the ones who have to tell us what is happening and they have to tell us in what urgent way we have to act and in what way. Well, if you look at science, uh, we, we made a kind of family portrait of graphs that some in one way or another are defining our current uh, state of the planet. Um, the, the, the thing you recognize is that the graphs are steep in our time and age. And, um, but also that a lot of things are going very, very well. If you look at the graphs in the middle, the declining of uh, poverty, extreme poverty, amazing what we have achieved. Uh, if you look at uh, the growth of democratic systems, of uh, child vaccination, a lot of fields we are doing really great. But of course, as we all know, uh, there are some domains where we are failing. If you look in the way the biodiversity is declining, that 
definitely is, I think, the fast, uh, the, the most important thing we have to address. This is evolution which uh, was erected in the, in the course of millions of years that we are wiping away in one generation, forever lost. Very important to take responsibility. As uh, this temperature race, and we know it, the Germans call it in a beautiful word, word uh, the Chicksalsfrage. This is the question that will define our destiny. And as we all know, uh, science tells us above one and a half degrees, the effects will be unpredictable and irreversible. Uh, something we have to deal with because uh, the current way it is developing, it looks as if we might reach that already in 2030. Big thing to deal with. And these questions have a global scale. And that makes it interesting. If you look at it as a um, way to represent where the world population is living. And what in a way is amazing is what we see in the Netherlands, that uh, the growth of the population is uh, concentrated in the cities in the west of the country, close to the shore, to the sea line. That is a global phenomenon. Everywhere on this planet, uh, the, the coastal areas are growing the fastest fastest. And that is um, not a good combination uh, with a potential sea rising. And um, But we see it happen. One of the most threatened uh, cities on this planet is uh, Miami. This is a seaside uh, Miami these days. And uh, amazing to see that in America, especially under the Trump uh, doctrine, uh, talking about climate change was not doing scientific a statement, but putting a political statement. This is seaside uh, in Japan. The blue is the sea. And these are the walls that uh, collectively filled uh, with the last uh, tsunami. So you see also the tech fix, not necessarily the right approach. In my uh, essay, I, I drew this map of the world, and it's, it's actually a population map in the sense that um, Every pixel is representing 70 million inhabitants. So that is the population of the Netherlands. If you take the same pixel 453 times, you have the world population. So that is to put the Netherlands in perspective to the global population. And there are two ways to look at this. One way is to say, well, look at it. The Netherlands is so small, so it uh, doesn't matter what we think. It doesn't matter what we do, because we basically will never will be able to play a role on the planet scale. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at this is uh, how many pixels can you identify that are as well positioned as the Netherlands to address all these big issues. The Netherlands is an extremely wealthy country. We're well organized, we're well educated, we're well uh, we have enormous experience uh, with water-related questions. And I think there are not that many pixels in this global community that are as well positioned as the Netherlands to take responsibility. And that, I think, is where these questions are about. What responsibility do we take? And how do we put our knowledge, our uh, collaboration power in this game? I think the, 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 the questions are all cultural questions, all social questions. And uh, I always love to refer to literature and to film and to arts in general. And uh, I love this quote I found of uh, Saul Below, uh, who says, well, everybody, every generation finds it very difficult to live in their own time. Every generation thinks, well, we have it's, the difficulties we're facing, uh, this is too much. It's in all time and ages. And he says, well, we can not allow ourselves to be disappointed in our own time and age to identify ourselves with a better past. So I translate this as we have to define a future that we believe in. There is no way that we can allow ourselves to be disappointed in our own time. And the, the, the mechanism for that is it's not so difficult, you could say. Uh, we, we addressed it as saying, looking at what we are facing, the big global questions, there are three principles we have to uh, 
uh, adapt. Basically, look at it from the spatial way of view. These questions have a spatial connotation. Look at them integral. You cannot separate one issue from another. They all are uh, interlocked. And look at the long term. These questions you cannot answer with a time frame of three, four or five years. You have to look uh, ahead 10, 20, 30 years. Something we, we, we did in different ways. Uh, we at one moment uh, created a panorama of the Netherlands, uh, basically saying, we'll show you what the Netherlands can look uh, like in 2050. 2050 is about the time frame we have to address these big questions. That's the time we have. What we sell, uh, basically show is if we define the right answers, we have a lot of qualities to gain. This is a Netherlands to long for. And uh, we think uh, if we want to have a motor for the transition, the strongest motor you can generate is create a collective longing for change. Something we, um, we, uh, we found uh, was working really well to show an optimistic, positive future perspective. Uh, we got a lot of attention, uh, all the newspapers uh, wrote about it, and uh, we also made a, a real panorama, a, a 360 view of the Netherlands in 2050. Traveling around, uh, already for two years it's uh, traveling, uh, we had to print a second one because of so many demands, always combined with lectures. People are interested in the future in a way they can believe in it. And um, that has to do, of course, also with how we see where we have to act. If you look at what we have seen the last 30 years, it's, it's amazing. The, the technology, the, the digital world, the online world, so the way they developed, uh, great. The question is, are we answering the right questions? Uh, to that, uh, I, I want to refer to this example. I'm not sure whether you know it, but I'll explain it. Uh, this is a bomber from the Second World War, an American uh, plane. And they lost a lot of planes during the war. So they found uh, that they had to reinforce their planes. And they had the smart idea to, to monitor where the planes were hit by the bullets. So they started to mark uh, the positions where the plane got uh, the bullet holes. So that, these are the red dots. It's a collection of many planes. And um, they made a scheme to reinforce the planes at these spots. Of course, they want to minimize the amount of area you reinforce to, uh, to save weight. But then all of a sudden they had this brain wave and they said, well, really weird huh? that there are now bullet holes in the cockpit or in the motor. And then they realized they were monitoring uh, the planes that actually managed to get back to them. The planes that crashed all had the bullet holes at the other points, of course. So they reversed the logic, and that, I think, is what the art of changing of direction looks like. We always think about the future in a way that we, uh, we think we can handle it, the tech can handle it. And um, that, of course, is true for a great extent, but not for everything. What I find interesting from this COVID time is the, the way we start to look at things differently. For the last years, we have been looking at the, the, the future of automotive, the self-steering automobiles, automobiles. The good thing we learn now in the COVID crisis is that maybe the revolution is not only in the self-steering mechanism, but that the real revolution is in the notion that maybe we can do with less travel. That is the real revolution, and it's not a tech revolution, it's a cultural revolution. And that, I think, is um, the thing we are facing for the coming decades. Uh, I made a time frame here for you to, to understand how close 2050 is. And measured in time, it's as far away from us as is 1990. That is what 30 years looks like. And I think uh, from the last 30 years, we have seen a really beautiful, radical, revolutionary development in the virtual world. But the questions we are facing now are questions of the real world. So the transformative change we are facing will be a radical and revolutionary development of the real world. And that is beautiful. That means that instead of leaving a trace of destruction, 
we can now, with all our knowledge, with all our technology, start to act in the real world in real time. And that asks the power, the art of changing direction. In my essay, I use uh, the Hadza as an example for that. These are the last uh, hunter-gatherers uh, uh, tribes in the world. They live in Tanzania. And in a scientific um, uh, test, they've put these people uh, in a terrain they are not familiar with. So these are highly skilled people. They know how to survive in any surrounding uh, uh, terrain. But this is a terrain they never had entered before. So the, the scientific question was, okay, how are they going to operate in order to find food? Will they walk a straight line? Will they take a certain area they explore? What is it? Um, the graph on the right it shows their movement. And uh, at first glance, this looks like chaos, but it is not. It's a pattern, it's a scientific uh, described pattern by Levi, and he has uh, baptized it uh, the survival pattern. And it's a very, very intriguing pattern of movement. And it's a pattern that uh, you also see with whales swimming in the ocean. This is a pattern you also see with bees and all, uh, different kinds of birds. And this is a search pattern which you also find on the newest search engines on the internet. The essence of this pattern is the capability of changing direction. We are all trained to walk from A to B in a straight line. And that's the perfect logic if you know where B is. If you don't know where B is, if you don't know what you are facing, then following a straight line is a strategy that will be deadly. The survival pattern is about uh, as soon as you take a direction and you find with an analysis, good observation, that you took the wrong direction or that another direction is more promising, then you have to change direction. And this is um, what we are facing in our Western culture. We do know that a lot of things are threatening us. We do know that we need to change. We do not know what exactly are the right steps, but we do know that something has to happen. So in our time and age, in the coming decades, it will be not the straight line from A to B, but the art of changing direction as the survival pattern in a very literal way. And that's nice. This will act on improvisation, one of the lost forms of intelligence. And that's something you can apply in many different fields. If you, for instance, look at, uh, we have to build in the Netherlands one million homes in the coming decade. But we do know that concrete, the material we build our homes in, uh, is uh, responsible for about 9% of the CO2 emissions. So should we, at this moment, build a million homes in concrete? I don't think so. Although the construction companies are willing and acting uh, in that manner. But uh, you can look at it different, eh? and these are discussions currently being uh, um, held and developed. Uh, if you start a new construction technology with bio-based materials, you do the reverse. You can build a million homes and actually capturing CO2 instead of um, emissions. And these are things we, we are testing, we are, we are investigating, okay, but what does it mean? What does it can we deal with these numbers? And the good thing is that you can build houses and improve the landscape and the biodiversity, etc. at the same time. You can combine interests. It's not so that uh, the, the profit in one domain has to be a loss in the other. You can combine things with good planning, with good thinking. And that's what I mean with all these questions are social questions and cultural questions. Uh, we have 40% one person, one person house, households, we have an aging population. So we can change directions in the way we think about how we want to build our houses. A different culture, a different way of thinking, a different way of planning, a different way of taking responsibility means that we can build a million house, homes in our cities. We don't have to take open areas uh, uh, outside the cities. Very interesting what the, the power of imagination and the power of design can do here. And of course, uh, this day is about energy. Um, uh, we have to 
rethink the way we uh, feed our households with uh, with the energy. A lot of promising projects are being um, developed, and of course we have to skill things now. And that's one of the things we we also investigated um, uh, from our um, position. And of course, uh, talking about energy, you talk about Europe. You talk. You have to think international. Uh, the simple fact that. Um, Despite Brexit, uh, the British people are still um, one hour uh, time difference. It can mean that you uh, switch peak uh, demands of energy. But we, we studied at one moment uh, last year um, what would the Netherlands look like if we go for 100% sustainable energy. What choices do we have to make? Can we handle it as a country? And um, I'm not going to elaborate on all this, but you, you easily can find uh, the report on, on the internet. Uh, like, okay, what are the switches? Of course, the current system is based on, on, uh, on gas, uh, coal and uh, oil. But things can change. We are working on it. What kind of possibilities do we have? But of course, it's not just a matter of switching uh, different uh, streams. The question is, how does it work in the real world? How does it work in, uh, in this case uh, in the Netherlands? So how do we deal with the heating systems in our homes? What urban density do you need for special conditions? But uh, one big debate, of course, is the, the wind energy, wind on land. On the left side, we, we sketched four scenarios. Um, uh, what kind of control do you have on where to put them? Basically, the, the, the fourth scenario is the nightmare scenario, the confetti. Everybody puts some windmills on some locations, and um, which means everywhere there will be windmills, also in a position where actually the wind conditions are not so great. So we said, depending on your political will, your political power, you could look at different uh, scenarios. And uh, the one on the right side is, what if the central government takes control? The diagram on the right delivers the same amount of power as the confetti. You can have control. That, of course, has to do with not only the mills, but the entire infrastructure you need for electricity. Uh, how do you develop it? Uh, interesting the way wind on sea will be very, very important in the, in the coming uh, decades. Uh, of course, hydrogen uh, will start to play a role, but only limited uh, in our opinion. But we said you cannot talk about energy transition if you do not talk about the uh, uh, transition in agriculture. So we also looked at it. What does it mean if you go to circular agriculture? What does it mean for our urban urbanization patterns? All these things you have to combine. Tests we do, and of course, as I said, this has to do with also political uh, power. Let's see what these elections bring, huh? and maybe a new ministry. Uh, but anyway, there needs to be a strategy. There needs to be a coherent planning, because talking about energy, sustainable energy supply, it touches all agendas. And that is something you have to be aware of. You cannot develop sustainable energy without looking at all these other elements. Because the open space has many owners, has many interests, and you need to combine that. For agriculture, we have a policy that we say, um, simply take a high quality landscape as a boundary condition, and then see what you can produce on that soil. The same you could say for, for energy production. Take the landscape conditions, take uh, the characteristics of an area into account when you're planning. And some landscapes can perfectly deal with these windmills, other landscapes you should have another agenda. And that is, I think, how we should look at planning. That's how we should look at identity and history and the new cultural and energy developments. Customization to a regional scale is the key. And as you probably all know, as, as uh, the specialists tell us, uh, act now. If you want to be cost efficient, act now. Don't wait until 2030, 2040. It's now that we have to act. And um, I want to end with uh, the notion of, uh, of not knowing where to go. 
And um, I think I'll, I'll give you some clues how to act in this labyrinth. And uh, I like the metaphor of labyrinth as the situation we are in. Because in the labyrinth, uh, the art of changing direction is not only an art, but it's also the pleasure. The fact that we do not know what our route will be is, is great. It's improvisation, it's culture, it's, um, it's an adventure, and it's a very relevant one. But I'll give you some clues to find a way in the labyrinth. I think the first clue would be a um, quote from Simone de Beauvoir. In uh, La Vieillesse, uh, a book on elderly people, uh, she says, if you want to look what the real quality of a society is, the true value, look at the way they deal with the most vulnerable. And I think if you talk about uh, energy transition, that is so true. How is it possible that the poorest people pay the highest price for the energy transition? Something we have to address. In the energy transition, it's not a technical question. We can deal with the technique. We can deal with all the new uh, smart ways to produce energy. It's a social question how to implement it. I think another clue for finding your way in the labyrinth is uh, be optimistic. This is where we are, sustainability versus time. And uh, we are changing directions in this field. And how beautiful is that? It's enormously difficult, but we can do it. There is a way to handle it. And uh, great if this is true. And um, I think uh, one other way of phrasing uh, responsibility and optimism is a quote by Yeats, uh, one of my favorite uh, poets. And he says, uh, in dreams becomes responsibility. Dreams are the beginning of your responsibility. The fact that you can imagine how things can be done differently creates responsibility. So take that responsibility of imagination. Imagination, um, the quote of uh, Paris 1968, uh, Sous les pavés, la plage, under the tiles uh, waits the beach. That is what imagination does. And my last uh, slide is, um, I think, summarizing all the, the earlier uh, remarks I made. Uh, this is um, to repair with gold. This is the Japanese technique to repair a broken pottery. But the essence is that in this logic and this philosophy, they say uh, the fact that it's broken is part of the identity, it's part of its beauty. And uh, the act, uh, the, the, the fact that it's broken is not important. It's the quality of the repair that counts. And I think this is true for our society, for our time and age. Uh, we see a lot of failing structures, climate change, biodiversity, the agriculture. But the essence is not the fact that these systems are failing. The essence will be in our culture of repairing it. And if we repair uh, that, what is broken with gold, then we gain. So I'll stop sharing my screen and then uh, there's all the time for questions. Thank you very much, Floris, for the fantastically interesting presentation. I have to say, as an Irishman, I appreciate the inclusion of a quote from William Butler Yeats. Very much yes. appreciated on my on my side anyway. Right, what I'd like to do to start some of the questions is to introduce Richard van der Sande, who's the Scientific Director for IRIS. But before I bring Richard in to ask a couple of questions of Floris, please mm. send in your questions. If you have any questions you'd like me to ask on your behalf, to Flores after Richard has done his, I'll be very happy to. I now hand over to Richard van der Sande, who's going to have a couple of questions for Flores. Richard. Yes, thank you very much, Flores. Um, I, I very much enjoyed reading your uh, your your uh, your essay also, and also uh, I very much liked your presentation on this topic. Um, and actually, my, my question refers to uh, maybe uh, something you mentioned also during your your, your presentation. Um, namely, the, the the role of the government in taking, let's say, direction or, or coordination of this, and 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 looking to the upcoming elections. What is your opinion? Is this going to be high on the agenda? The 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 urge for change. Uh, do you see this happening? Um, 
I'm, to, I'm afraid I have to say yes and no, in the sense that a lot of the political parties see the need for more central government uh, uh, strategies, and, uh, but they focus it on, on the, the need for the one million homes. And my biggest fear is that they have will put a lot of energy, probably a new ministry or a new minister, but that he will be or he or she will be devoted to the one million homes. And um, uh, we uh, made a plea to say, don't make it a minister for, for housing, make it a minister for space, in the sense that uh, look, and also at uh, agriculture, also look at uh, energy transition, also look at etc. etc. Like I said in my lecture, space has many inflict, uh, conflicts, many interests, many owners. And the biggest risk is that the government now takes a lot of dominant um, positions in producing houses, uh, but then uh, neglecting all the other elements. Uh, so um, after all these years of decentralization, the central government thinks it's important they also step up. But I hope they do see the real question. Yeah, and, and so so in, in, in this respect, uh, because what we have seen, of course, in, 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 in these last few years is that they basically have made it very decentral, which, which actually led to, I would say, suboptimal solutions. And I think your, your Via Paris, uh, Via Paris uh, kind of document is, is really opening, I think, an, 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 a view on how to tackle this. Yeah. Um, so so in, in that respect, so you think that, that or you, you expect that there will be, let's say, on the government side, something like a, a minister who's going to tackle this. Um, but do you, do you also think that, let's say, I think, Eventually, we all have to do it. Eh? It's the the change we all have to do. And, and, and so how are we going to actually work on that? No, exactly. Everybody has to work on it. And we produced uh, via Paris, uh, the document, but uh, the ministry uh, was not pleased with it. They said, well, you, you make people afraid. Eh? There's so much change in your document. Eh? Yeah. We said, well, prepare the people. Huh? This is what is going to happen. Huh? We have to, to face things. And better to start a discussion now than first aim at 2030 with small uh, increment. And then again, you have to define another uh, supplementary strategy. In that sense, um, uh, the idea of the ministries of uh, not making people afraid is uh, not necessarily the best tactic, I think. Like I said, we try to convince people to long for a future. Huh? And uh, as I see it, uh, all people in this society currently are thinking about well, how can I take responsibility? And I think it's true for governments, but also for civilians. Everybody's working on it, but also the market is repositioning itself. Uh, education is such an important role, and uh, everybody faces a very, very difficult question. And um, to me, um, and that's also what I write in my, my essay, um, there is a key role for uh, scientists, but also for the arts. Uh, the power of imagination, the power of telling the story, okay, but this time and age, we can do it, but this and this has to happen. And uh, to design a future, that is a real uh, creative thing. Yeah. And, um, but in the end, um, I, despite all the red flags uh, around us, uh, I'm optimistic that we, we can handle it. And uh, in my most optimistic uh, mood, I compare it with, uh, with the rocket, which is about to, to uh, fire. And uh, you see it tremble uh, without moving, but you know uh, once it's gone, it will be accelerating really fast. Eh? But that, I think, hope is what we are facing. Yeah, on the other hand, you know, we also see, and then maybe uh, then I'll go to, to buy because probably there are a lot of questions in the chat in the meantime. Um, what we have seen with, with COVID, of course, is that we can change overnight mm. uh, in, in a sense, but but uh, but that is might be uh, something where the urgency is much more apparent. Um, but I am looking at you. So, so are there questions uh, from the chat which you could actually uh, address? To, to well, there is there's there's a very nice question there that uh, from a comment you just said there, Richard, that I can link into, and that is in relation to the corona. So, Floris, you were speaking about the corona changing radically um, our way of thinking and acting, but there are still climate non-believers. How do you think they can be convinced? 
Well, um, I don't think we can convince everybody. And um, but I also think it's not necessary to convince everybody. Yeah? I think there's a, there should be a general movement and then in the end uh, things will, will change. And, uh, but to me, uh, looking at COVID, uh, what's interesting about this moment is that um, we don't think take things for granted anymore. So, so we, we are hesitating, we're doubting, and that, that is great. That, uh, but on the same time, the changes that are implemented now are changes born out of fear. And I don't think fear is a stable basis for transformations. It means basically as soon as you're not afraid anymore, then you, you turn back to your, your earlier behavior. And um, so to me, um, I think we need changes not born out of uh, illness, not born out of fear, but born out of uh, good thinking about uh, imagination. Because if we wait until we are as afraid of uh, climate change and uh, the declining biodiversity as we are now for COVID, then we will be too late. We have to act now. And um, the fact that uh, a lot of people are still non-believers um, doesn't mean that we cannot change things. And, uh, but it has to do with we have to involve everybody. We have to bring the best uh, that we have in us. And uh, but the, the biggest thing is not to see it as a technical question. Of course, we need to develop all these technologies. Of course, we need to develop all these strategies. But in the end, we we, we need to make it a question that is addressing everybody. And um, as I said, we can do it. And uh, it's great to 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 know that uh, the com coming decades we will working on improving the real world uh, in real time and that uh, you and Eindhoven are really smart on the small scale but uh, now we have to jump to the to the bigger scale as well and uh, that is good news I think yes indeed and I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to a question from those in attendance and that's this question is from uh, Udo uh, Urlink and his question is this can you explain how building with wood is sustainable in a country that hardly has any trees left or space to grow new forests. Doesn't it require massive amounts of transport? Um, not necessarily all the wood has to come from the Netherlands, yeah? especially the, the first generation houses. Uh, we can go to Belgium and um, uh, transporting the wood is not so much energy. And uh, the, the, the biggest thing is now to, to uh, create factories that can uh, produce and, um, uh, the wood, uh, the, um, uh, process the wood. And uh, with that, we have amazing new possibilities for 3D milling machines, etc. Uh, we are testing that. The thing is that uh, CO2 is captured in bio-based uh, materials. On the same time, we're also working on a forest strategy for the Netherlands. And, um, we have a lot of space in the Netherlands for additional trees. Uh, the good thing with cross-laminated timber is that we also can use trees like poplar and uh, other softwood trees. Uh, currently, a lot of research is done in uh, different systems for gluing, so that the glue itself also becomes um, sustainable. And once you have done that, uh, the, the world is open for, for rapid um, upscaling of that market. And it's great to see that wood is so light that you can build a city on top of an existing city, like I showed in the example. So you, you can improve and work on, on uh, many different issues on the same time in our urban areas. And on the same time, by planting trees in the landscape, improve landscapes. It's, uh, you can combine it. Uh, if you look at agriculture, um, once you plant trees, soil conditions improve. So it could be also a new source of income for our farmers, eh, where they actually improve the soil instead of degrading it. So you can combine a lot of things, and that's what I try to explain. You have to look into uh, the entire chain of uh, production. I hope uh, the person who asked the question, uh, Ludo, that answers your question. Uh, Floris, thank you very much for your fascinating presentation. Mm -hmm. And I would like to thank you on behalf of Richard, who was also asking questions, and Iris and myself for fantastic piece of work. There are other questions, but unfortunately, we can't address all of them. We have to move on to the next speaker. So a very uh, warm thanks to Floris for his talk. A virtual round of applause, please, from everyone who is in front Thank of you. a camera. Uh, we're clapping here together. Thank you very much, Floris. Really appreciate your contribution today. Okay, you're welcome. Excellent. Oops.
Yeah. Right. Before we move on to the next speaker, we're going to reflect a little bit on some of the some of the topics that Floris was speaking about, and we're going to have some more Mentimeter questions. So I'm just going to switch over back to Mentimeter, and we have some questions based on Floris' talk. So here is the first question. Should we build the much needed new house, that should be houses, in the countryside instead of the cities in the Netherlands? So should we build them in the countryside instead of cities? I'm not going to put a number on the number of homes as we heard that the number of homes there has been mentioned, but uh, how to get there is, there are different ways and routes that can be taken. And uh, it's an interesting, mm -hmm. Interesting what we're seeing here, the consensus across the those who are voting on Mentimeter, the majority of people are saying no. So uh, we should not build the much needed homes in the countryside. And we should retain the urban feel and urban cities. Well, given that by 2050, I believe that 66% or 70% or so of the world's population will be living in urban centers. And this may align with what, uh, what we're seeing here with the uh, with the survey. Interesting indeed. Um, speaking as someone who comes from a country where there's quite a lot of space, I have to say I do like living in the countryside and uh, I would definitely be in the yes pile if I was able to answer this right now. And now I'll just move on quickly to the next question. The next question is this, do you think we have to give up some of our comforts to live more sustainably? Do we have to give up some of the comforts, the things that we that we, we're, we're quite comfortable with, pardon the pun. Yes, no, or remains to be seen. And quickly, straight away, we're seeing that there is a majority who are of the opinion that we need to sacrifice some degree of our current living standards or the way that we live at home or in our local environments or local areas. Well, there's a few people who say that we have to uh, we have to see how things go. We'll let this tick along for a couple more moments before we move on to the next speaker. It's always good to to get these opinions from everybody, and uh, I think it's very clear there a general consensus that uh, we should give up some of our our uh, comforts to live more sustainably. Right, we got 99. Let's see if we can get 100 responses on that. There we go, 101, and I'll stop it there. Fantastic. And I'll be back later on with some more additional questions. Now, let's get on to the second speaker. And the second speaker is Geert Verbong. Geert is an emeritus professor in transition studies at the School of Innovation Studies at TUE. His current research looks at social innovation and sustainability transitions. And looking at uh, Geert's uh, biography, I see he has a, a master's in applied physics and coming from a physics background myself as well. Uh, very nice to see. In his lecture, Geert will consider the challenges for the energy transition in the province of North Brabant, which will include, which include the lack of grid capacity for rapidly increasing number of solar PV projects we're seeing, and the need for a fair and inclusive energy transition involving our citizens. The title of his presentation is Social Innovation in the Energy Transition in the province of North Brabant. Geert, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, as, as I'll try to share my, my presentation. But, um, yes. Oh, but now you're in the way. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. I'm uh, actually. I'm happy that uh, to be invited. I'm very uh, honored to be invited for the speech. Actually, and that this energy days are still continuing. I uh, I started this with Dan Schramsen 12 years ago, so that's going on. That's fine. Second comment is that basically Floor has already summarized my uh, my uh, uh, talk in uh, in uh, in uh, just before that basically the energy transition is not mainly a technological transition, but a social transition, and that we need to scale up, really. Uh, but I will provide with a very uh, specific example how we can do that also in a fair way. So first, what I will do is say a little bit about modeling uh, we did, or students of ours did, for 100% renewable energy in North Brabant. Then I go on to the two main challenges. But uh, really, I think I will focus on a wind project 
along the A16 and how this is being organized. And then my basically call to action is that we need smart and socially connected uh, solutions. So this is this upscaling floors mentioned as well. So 100% renewables. Um, Note Lomans, you can really find his thesis uh, in, the, in the link below. Uh, so that's easy. So they basically looked at the options of 100% uh, renewables uh, in uh, North Brabant. He did it for the province. Basically, also input was used from landscape architects. I won't go into detail. I will just uh, discuss a few um, of the uh, conclusions from the scenarios he built from his model. That's one of first that electrification of heat and transport basically is reducing energy demand substantially, which is of course favorable for implementation. And also that 100% renewables are economically feasible, feasible, but under certain assumptions of, for example, the price of CO2, but also particularly for storage, short time storage by batteries and long time storage by hydrogen. And that wind offshore is actually the best option only if you really have a low percentage, smaller percentage of solar PV, then that it's cheaper. And then of course, as one of the policy issues is, Brabant does not have a shore basically to the sea, so is offshore for what Brabant possible. And also that PV uh, is from a social perspective, much more uh, attractive right now. Okay, and uh, but one of the thing is that uh, grid costs were not included in the study. That's basically the neon project that's running now is also looking at that. And also, uh, I put it here very boldly, but uh, his conclusion was that under the current situation and developments, the two, uh, 2030 goals will not be achieved. Now, what we also looked at is, for example, at some trends, and there are only two trends that are uh, relevant uh, here. One is the yellow trend, which basically is about co-firing in, in large power plants that's going down and it's becoming uh, basically uh, is being stopped. And then the other one is, of course, the dark, uh, uh, I think it's the black, almost black uh, line that's of solar energy, solar electricity that's going up a lot. So what's now the impact on electricity networks? And there was a, an article in the paper, in the NRC, Dutch newspaper, on how uh, uh, Leander approaches this topic. It was a couple of months ago. And then one of the things that really struck me is that, struck me is that he said, uh, we did not expect it going to so fast with the uh, growth of solar PV. And of course, the traditional solution has been the copper plate. So if you need more capacity, you increase the grid capacity. And basically, you're aiming at two times um, uh, uh, the current capacity. One very simple measure is basically is if you have a solar park not connected to the whole the 100% capacity, but only 70% capacity, which of course results in some losses, but that's actually really limited. And of course, you have always this option of curtailment. Um, now, first of all, I want to stress you, I'm not arguing that we should not invest in, 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 in increasing the grid capacity, but okay. So we well, have the climate agreements, and we know that all regions, energy regions are develop, uh, developing strategies, and there is really a very clear preference for solar park by, by a, a lot of municipalities. So there have been many applications. And that means that grid connection of those solar parks increasingly is, is a problem. And an excess basically states that there will be no extra capacity for the next five to seven years in Brabant. So how are we going to deal with it? Now, if I spoke about these issues for my students, I always say, what's the solution to problems in the electricity grid? It's smart grids. And what is a smart grid? Now, basically, there's no consensus about uh, what a smart grid actually uh, is. When my first meeting on smart grids is 15, 16 years ago at Novum in those days, IRVO nowadays, the first question was, please give us first a definition of smart grids. But we already soon agreed that this is impossible. And there are many, many ways to, soon, to really, see, uh, to really uh, look at smart grids. I gave a few examples there. But the, the one thing really has always been that smart grids have been presented as a solution for all problems. But the main promise is that if you use uh, you introduce smartness in the grid, then you have to invest less 
in increasing uh, grid capacity. Now, what happened? Of course, that in the, between 2005 and 2010, we started uh, setting up a, a, a large program, the IPIN, uh, Intelligente, uh, in, 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 in Intelligente Nette, Intelligent Smart, Smart Grids, basically. And there have been numerous, a uh, lot of small scale projects. Uh, a strategy uh, manager from Aliander told me that at a certain moment they had more than 100 projects they were uh, were uh, involved in. So what did we le learn? Increasing capacity is that the solution? And then of course, uh, you know, a very simple solution is basically what's called the solar ladder. And at first you use all the uh, the space on on roofs and and available. And then the other, the next step would be that you look at, for example, like roads or uh, uh, areas where it really does fit in well. And then you look at more sensitive locations. And, and the final thing would really be large solar parks. And what are we doing? We start with four and then also do a little bit of the others. But there are other options uh, as well. Uh, uh, organizing the uh, management of electricity, so, and we think we really should do that. And we should also try to solve those local problems more locally. And you can use flexibility, you can use sto storage, all kinds of things to deal with congestion. But this really needs institutional change, new uh, organization uh, models. For example, uh, a colleague of mine, she's working on community-based virtual power plants, but you could all think on a local level or more traditional utilities. And the thing is, and that's also been clear from the previous presentation, that we cannot wait. System innovation and social innovation is necessary and social innovation is the key. And of course, one thing I won't go into it, into it but I think electrification of transport is really uh, important. With the increasing number of electric vehicles, we really should introduce smart charging. It's very simple and it's a kind of no regret option. But also, if we have so many uh, electric vehicles, then vehicle to grip becomes this is becoming an option as well because there's so much uh, capacity as well. So we need to upscale. We need larger projects, but basically it is for whom? And then acceptance, because I put it between quotes, because that usually as it's being uh, framed, but I think it's a very wrong way of framing it, and participation are really key in this. And how to not to do it is basically discussion, and it was recent, also another discussion. This was a, a wind farm in the Wieringermeer, and it's basically mainly producing electricity for a large Microsoft uh, data center. And they basically all the people who were involved, uh, that's basically I, my translation of the quote, it's for, from the NOS side, uh, the, is that basically the, the people did not, the people living nearby did not feel taken seriously. They were really uh, disappointed about the way to do it. So how to do it then as well? Uh, of course, so, uh, first, of course, uh, the role of users. Um, it's also next to uh, reducing the capacity of the grids. It's also been a, a key element of a smart grid policy, empowerment of users and the smartness should make it possible. But still, in my research with engineers working on this, users often are seen part of the problem, basically, not a part of the solution. And then basically is the question always, uh, people working on innovation, technological innovation, is why people don't like their, at least part of, the, of some uh, uh, innovations, like wind turbines. And that's basically because the urgency is this large for climate change. But I would say, really, we need the opposition against wind park is really legitimate. But we need a f uh, we need really a fair transition, both from a procedural, inclusive, and also in the allocation of costs and benefits of that perspective. That's what Flo Alkemade in one of the Iris uh, seminars talked about. And we also know the answer already for quite a long time. We really should uh, make the people participate in not only the process, the outcome, but also the results. And that's also part of the larger uh, issue that people are complaining that the energy transition will be, will be way too expensive. And in particular, the poor people are going to pay uh, for this. Flores mentioned this as well. 
So how can you do it differently? This is the A16, probably known to a lot of people. It's basically going from Breda to Dordrecht and further on. And it has been a project proposed to put a lot of uh, basically 28 in total wind turbines along this, uh, along this uh, uh, basically, you could say, highway corridor. But the conditions for, for, uh, for this A16 wind park have been that everyone, every member of the local community should be uh, able to uh, participate. It really should be inclusive. And that also it should uh, be, that not the rich people should profit only the people who can afford, for example, solar cells or participating, buying shares in wind parks. But everybody should be involved in the allocation also in the benefits. And then the whole idea is that the profits by selling electricity and uh, are generated by the, those turbines, they are going to be used as a leverage for accelerating the local energy transition. Now, how does this look like? Basically, when um, this, uh, the slide is in Dutch, but basically what this picture does is putting the community central. And then you see the main types of actors, the government, the utilities, and the province, the citizens, basically, and all kinds of the, the industrial partners and investment uh, uh, companies that are uh, involved. And what they should do is basically, this is the zone, and that basically that the, the, the profits generated in this, in this zone should contribute to the sustainability and livability of this community. Um, Oh, no, that's too, uh, okay. It's not, uh, next. Yes. So, uh, what has been developed for, for this project is a new governance and participation model. And actually, the central was a central role for the provincial and local authorities. And of course, you can argue that the national government should also play a major role. But basically, here, that with the scale of the of the of the project has been 100 megawatt because then it could still fall under the provincial uh, governance. But the main thing is really that's of course the whole procedural that has been inclusive but also the thing is that 25 percent of the ownership of those wind turbines is for the local communities and one thing that happens uh, with this that the profits that are to be generated because they're still not working they are going to they are used to compensate directly impacted households people living really near those wind turbines and there has been developed uh, what they call a neighborhood arrangement for 161 households and all the large majority is participating now how does this look like basically is that you can ask uh, for a scan uh, what should be done you can do it yourself basically and you get basically compensated and also you get uh, every year an annual uh, compensation financial compensation you can also if it's not clear that's not standard thing that so it really needs to be customized again you can do it yourself but you can also do it, uh, let it do and even that's basically being paid for by money from this project so but also next to this and this also uh, addre is addressing one of the things that uh, Flores uh, has mentioned that also part of the money will be used for basically uh, improving local livability for all kind of energy uh, transition projects in the communities, nature, and also improving the landscape. Of course, this sounds very nice, but it has been not straightforward, basically. It has been quite a slow process. I will give an example of this. And uh, the direct engagement with citizen community really requires an active approach and really also to be careful uh, both to the community because emotions are running high often, but also with, for example, pro uh, uh, project developers who you should care for that they do not go away with uh, the, the main profits. There have been all kinds of regulatory hurdles. Uh, for example, people complaining up to until the Supreme Court, um, uh, and then, of course, and there have been the financial arrangement have been very uh, complex. So, so this is just showing already the project started in the first of these in 2011, and now almost uh, 10 years later, the wind turbines are being uh, starting to be built. 
and it will take one or two more years before they're going to uh, produce. So you can really see that a lot has been happening. For example, here, the the Supreme Raad van State 2009, the Supreme Court has been dealing with all kinds of co uh, complaints, also from people actually participating in the neighborhood arrangement, although that's, that's one thing, but also, for example, whether this kind of arrangement was uh, legally allowed, whether it was not a form of subsidy. And the other, to give just an idea how complex the financial uh, arrangements are, there's a participation fund uh, up front, but it is really divided in all kinds of things. And then you can see in the middle where the 25% really is going to a firm that really can, uh, under, uh, under government, uh, public governance, that really can make sure that the, the profits really go to the uh, to the to the people. So this is part of a social and innovation uh, program in the energy transition in Brabant, and I would say this is a prime project, a prime example of how we can do things differently. And actually, one should be aware that the policy goals are moving that for large scale uh, renewable projects, um, uh, participation of uh, communities and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, municipalities should move up to 50 percent. There's a whole booklet about this, unfortunately in Dutch, about whole, how this has developed. And it is also part of a much more, a broader program. It's called the Collaborative Program of the Province and Antwerp. Antwerp is basically part of uh, Annexis. And this, and I should really mention um, Martijn Messing, he's really the key player in this. There's a focus on learning, basically, how can we learn from this? It's also offering a platform for a changing experience, and it's also building capacity, for example, by training energy coaches, and also uh, a platform for discussion. And really, people should have a look at this website I mentioned here. So, my plea actually, and it's almost my last slide, is that this is about smart and socially collected solution, uh, solutions. So we cannot wait five to seven years and doing nothing. And I would say really, and that's what, what uh, Flo has already mentioned, we should not do another smart project, or maybe we should do it, but we really also should look at larger pilots, really upscaling this. And then we also need to, for other solutions, basically, changing direction in the, in the, in the way Flores mentioned this. And then also, of course, we should take participation in a serious way so that all, uh, all people, all citizens can participate. And what, what I wanted to show with this A16 project is really, that's it possible, but it will not be easy or straightforward. It really takes a, time, uh, a lot of time. And that's why I, my call is, and that's my final sentence, is basically for smart, we need uh, smart and social, uh, socially connected solutions. So, I'll move this away. Uh, yes, okay. Thank you very much here for the presentation. Everyone can hear me okay? Yes, yes. Good, good, good. I can hear, I can myself, hear myself, just so, just people, so people know, know which is why, why I'm, I'm saying, saying that. Right, right, let's, let's get, into get into some, some of the questions, questions then with Gert in relation to his presentation. And, and to ask the questions, questions going to bring in David Smulders, professor from the Eindhoven University of Technology. David. Hi. Uh, Geert, before we go to the questions from the audience, uh, maybe a short question uh, to you from my side. You had on your second slide, you had a very beautiful picture of the province of North Brabant, yeah. which seemed to illustrate the fact that we have to go beyond the province of North Brabant because all the wind turbines were organized along the borders as if not to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, in, in let's say uh, it comes into conflict with uh, with the population. Is is that correct? It seemed no, uh, to be uh, organized like that. No, it's a very simple answer because you needed to. That's also uh, offshore wind has been included, and they have basically put there. It's not uh, that uh, uh, that's a way of dealing with it in the model that has been made of the province. So you should actually there. 
And then, of course, it's an open question whether it's you should allow it, and I think you should do it. But of course, uh, it's just you you need them somewhere in the picture uh, where the offshore wind turbines are. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe. David, if, David, if you have any more questions, we'll be very happy to hear them. And of course, to the, those who are watching, please send your questions in that I can address to Geert as well. Okay, great. I have another question, Geert, uh, because your uh, presentation seems to be focused on electricity. Yeah. But what about uh, heat grids? Because I think the government policy is also uh, arranging uh, quite some effort in getting uh, heat grids from... Uh, let's say, uh, this level to a higher perspective? Yes, I, I should say, imagine that uh, heat has been uh, included in the model, at least to a certain degree. Uh, and that, that's, uh, that's, that's an option as well, but it, it, it should be more elaborated and the focus has been on electricity. Now, of course, as you know, uh, there are many ways to provide heat to houses. And uh, basically, I would call them competing systems on the one hand, you have the all electric and the other one, you have indeed the, the, the heat uh, uh, networks, the heat grids. Um, and then, of course, you also still have uh, hydrogen or uh, biogas. Yes, that, but that I didn't, I have a very specific uh, opinion on that, but that was not in, in this presentation. Okay, but then maybe, maybe to work. Uh... That's basically that for the built environment, actually, we actually can do. Uh, without large-scale uh, heat uh, networks. Okay, so you're not in favor of heat uh, networks? Of uh... Small-scale, yes, you can do it. And you, But what I really would think it's poss needed is, is, of course, heat storage, heat and cold storage, or basically also the research you are doing on heat storage, that's really, and heat batteries, that's absolutely, I think, crucial. But uh, basically, if you I insulate houses in a way and ventilate, and that's also uh, ventilation is crucial, uh, to, uh, up to a maximum standards. Basically, the, the amount of heat is really low. And if you do for, look for other options as well, uh, heat pumps, also in uh, if you do who, uh, use heat storage, uh, then basically you can also provide cooling, which is increasingly becoming uh, an issue as well. So I'm not not necessarily uh, um, against it, but I think on a local level, uh, you can, for example, uh, using difference in aquatermy, uh, these kind of things, options. So that really, but large scale heat networks, like for example, uh, um, around the Arma Centrale, I don't think that's a very good idea. Those are okay. second generation heat networks, and we need to move to the fifth generation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, David, for the question. I have a question from one of the those in attendance from uh, Florian Lemaitre, who asks, have you taken into consideration the development of nuclear power in the energy transition for, I guess, for North Brabant? Actually, it has been, it has been included the option for in the model. Uh, I didn't do it. Uh, and, and there have been... Um, uh, uh, have been uh, uh, proposals for doing this in Brabant. Actually, of course, my first start was in the history of technology, and when I also studied history of electricity system in the Netherlands, we had in the 1950s the the managing director of the PNEM, that was the local, the regional, the provincial utility. He was called Petit, but he thought very big, and he want, wanted already the first nuclear power plant in the province of North Brabant. But then, actually, North Brabant basically, after nuclear energy basically proved too big an issue for a, a small company. So yes, you could do it, but where do you want to put it? And basically the only location in the Netherlands where I would say now that um, uh, there, there's room for a nuclear power plant is basically Boxler. Okay, so that I hope answers the question from Florian. And I think it's nice to end and this. We'll, we'll use this as the last question for you. And it's from uh, uh, Sonia Knowles who asks, how do you include the lower socio-economical groups in participation initiatives? Because very often it is exactly these groups that need the financial compensation um, that most do not know how to acquire said financial compensation. So how do you how do you make sure they're included in these type of initiatives? First of all, for this neighborhood uh, uh, arrangement, actually all the people that they have I mean, directly 
contacted and they have been organized and they showed up. So then that were basically people from all kind of say social and, and income class. So we did and that really worked. And that those meetings have been very emotional sometimes. But at the, at the end, at least people tell me were there, they got applause because basically it, what they were taking seriously. Then of course with the communities, the, of course that still they could not ad, uh, address everybody, but still it it should be that basically the money is going to everyone and also everyone who who cannot uh, uh, support, uh, provide their own funding for doing project. It's the the this project offers the opportunity to fund those kind of uh, things and basically how to arrange it exactly. Yes, uh, that's very complicated, but uh, it's it's the the, the prime as uh, aim of goal of this of this approach was really also including those people, and that's also and I think uh, they have been quite successful. It's never perfect, and that's also what uh, Flores was saying. It will never be 100% of the people will be convinced or reach basically, but still uh, this inclusiveness of the project is really key of the whole approach. Excellent. Thank you very much for the answer, Gert, uh, Sonia. I hope that addresses your question. Thank you um, for giving your presentation, uh, Gert. A virtual round of applause from everybody um, who is at home. I'm clapping anyway, and I see other people are also clapping on my on my call that I can see. Thank you very much. Very interesting discussion. I'm fascinated by the A16 wind uh, wind initiatives. I think that's really cool. Right. Let's look at Mentimeter once again to menti.com. The code is on the screen. It's the same one we've had before. And we're going to swap over and just answer a couple of questions on what we have seen from Gert and his presentation. So let's get on to those questions. Well, the first one here is, as a citizen, do you feel sufficiently involved in the energy transition? Simple yes or no on this one. And uh, yeah, well, we see there the answers are coming in. And uh, at the moment, it's, uh, it's fascinating watching these bars dancing on screen as the votes come through. But the general consensus here at the moment is that it is no. And we have uh, just over 50. We'll give it a couple of moments. So in general, many people here feel that they're not efficiently or sufficiently involved in the energy transition as a citizen, that is. OK, so I'll give it a couple more seconds just for a couple more uh, votes to come through. Thank you very much for, for that. I'll move on to the next question. Next question is a couple of statements. And here they are. So the first one is climate change is more a social than a technical issue. Now, this is leaning on what we heard in the first first talk in relation to what uh, Flores was speaking about. And the second one, we shouldn't worry too much about the implementation of renewable energy options. Citizens will get used to it. And you can strongly agree or strongly disagree with these statements. So I'll give you a couple of moments just to answer these questions and you can see of course those who are familiar with Mintimeter the distribution of the answers coming from people it's always very interesting to see this because you get to see the numbers changing the bars changing and also you get an idea of the general consensus of everybody and the distribution of the marks and we see here that you know we've had 36 and in terms of the climate change most people agree that climate change is more of a social issue rather than a technical issue, something that was mentioned and addressed by Floris in our first presentation today. And in the second one, we shouldn't worry too much about the implementation of the renewable energy options. Citizens will get used to it. I think this leans into the previous question we had as well. And uh, the majority of people are not so in much in agreement with that statement. Very interesting and great to have you participate in this manner. So thank you very much for answering the questions today as part of this. Great to have you participate, not only in it, giving questions to the speakers, but also answering those elements as well. I'd like to finally give a, a nice virtual round of applause to our speakers once again, to Flores Alcameda and to Gert Verbong. Once again, I'm clapping here by myself at, uh, in my apartment and, and I see here some other people clapping, which is great, fantastic. And thank you for being with us today for Energy Days. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've uh, found the discussion, the presentations insightful. You've all learned something new. I certainly have uh, learned something new in relation to the energy transition today. And one last thing, because it's important to tell you about what's coming next. And the next Energy Days will take place on Thursday, June 3rd. So please mark it in your calendar. We'll be back with another Energy Day session and uh, we have to finalize the theme for that. So that will be announced over the coming, the coming days, the coming weeks. 
So we look forward to welcoming you for that particular session as well. I'm sure it will also be a stimulating discussion. I've been your host, Barry Fitzgerald. On behalf of everyone who is part of the Energy Days Organization Committee, IRIS and Eindhoven University of Technology, I say thank you very much for being here. And in the meantime, in the current times we find ourselves in, everyone please stay safe and stay healthy. And see you again soon. Bye for now.